Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak today. It's really a great privilege. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Communicate to Vaccinate project, which, um, uh, as mentioned, is funded by the Research Council of Norway. It's quite a large international project that uh, has partners in Australia, Cameroon, well, actually, the partners are in uh, Australia, Norway, Switzerland, France, Mozambique, and Nigeria, but we also did some primary research in Cameroon. So uh, I think it's important because it's a mix of uh, partners and research in high and low and middle income countries. Um, the focus of the whole project is on communication related to childhood vaccination, and the project's sort of a big picture approach to this. Um, as we know, communication is already a, a, an important feature. I love that, that no, no vaccinated, not vaccinated, no kisses. I found that on the internet and I thought it was great. So it's kind of great to um, tie it into where it came from today. Um, it's already a critical feature of pretty much every vaccination program um, because we know that communication can generate demand for routine vaccination. It can promote uh, wide scale vaccination campaigns and address misinformation and critically, uh, I think it's a very important tool in addressing vaccine hesitancy. But uh, the purpose of the COMVAC project uh, or, or the remit of the COMVAC project is really to, strength to strengthen the research evidence base um, for this communication because we want to reduce research waste uh, and we also want to provide some practical guidance so that we can start to move forward and hone these interventions based on evidence. So there's three key project themes that I'm going to go into very briefly uh, and just show you a few of the outputs and some of the implications. So this is a four-year project um, that was preceded by a different two-year version. So it's sort of a six-year project. So um, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of moving parts in all of that. One of the first things that we did in the COMVAC project uh, was to define and map uh, communication interventions. So communication is a, a huge word and it's used all over the world and it, it, it has many different ways of being um, uh, put into practice. So we wanted to get a sense of the bigger picture, what types of interventions are included in communication for childhood vaccination. Um, and how do these strategies differ in different contexts, uh, such as countries, country income levels, um, differences between routine vaccination and mass campaigns. So the first thing we did was develop a classification system or a taxonomy of communication interventions. Uh, and this is just a very uh, cursory overview of it. We've organized it according to the purpose of the communication. And the reason for that was we wanted to help people conceptualize communication as potential solutions to problems. So if you think about, um, you know, if one of your problems is people uh, not coming in for their due vaccinations, you know, the purpose that you might want to uh, address there is to remind or recall people. Um, we used this taxonomy uh, for a range of uh, research tasks, the first of which was to map the evidence that exists in trials um, so that we could prioritize some systematic review topics. Uh, obviously, systematic reviews can be valuable even if they don't find any trials in that area, but we wanted to focus in areas where we thought that there was trial evidence. So we um, uh, used the taxonomy and ended up doing two different Cochrane reviews on face-to-face -face communication to inform or educate and community-aimed interventions to inform or educate parents and communities. We also use the taxonomy as a framework uh, in primary research. So in the three African countries that we did field work in, so Cameroon, Nigeria, and Mozambique, um, the researchers observed interventions being used, observed communication being used in practice, and also interviewed people involved in communication, uh, and mapped those interventions according to the taxonomy which then allowed them to compare what was being done across these different country settings and also what was being done uh, in the purpose of uh, routine vaccination promotion versus um, mass campaigns such as for polio. Uh, the next thing, so that was one major piece of work and provided the standardized language for communication that we use throughout the COMVAC project. But the other important, or another important theme of the project was understanding stakeholder perspectives uh, on vaccination communication. So we need to know what people think and feel about that communication experience so that we can improve the design and delivery of communication. We pursued this in two different ways, the first of which was um, we did a qualitative evidence synthesis 
Um, Cochrane, the Cochrane collaboration has just started to involve um, qualitative evidence in their uh, systematic review library. And so this one, which is about to be published, uh, was a synthesis of parents' perspectives and views, uh, qualitative studies of parents' perspectives and views on the vaccination communication interaction related to routine childhood vaccination. Um, this is just one, it's very hard to summarize the findings of that in one slide, but one of the pieces of work that came out of that was some implications for practice um, based on those qualitative studies. The other thing we did was we ran a series of focus groups, uh, primarily in Australia, but one internationally as well, uh, with parents, healthcare providers, researchers, government policymakers, uh, and international government and NGO representatives. Uh, and we were asking them for their views about the communication, ab about vaccination communication, but more specifically, we wanted to know what makes communication effective or good from their perspective and what makes it bad or ineffective. Um, and so these are just a few of the interesting quotes that we pulled from that um, experience. But what we really uh, analyzed out of those um, discussions fed into our third theme, which was establishing what outcomes we should measure in order to evaluate the effects of vaccination communication. Um, many reviews note that there are problems with uh, primary study design and the outcomes that primary studies measure. And this means that it's very difficult for us to synthesize the results of all these different studies. It means that there's potentially research waste because people are implementing uh, strategies that are very complicated in these really interesting settings, but then they may only measure whether vaccination uptake increased. Um, and as we know, there's so, so many f factors involved in whether a communication intervention um, results in that behavior change. And so, we wanted to know more about uh, what else might be impacted by communication and what might be important to measure. So we developed a, um, a framework of outcome categories. So these are the outcome domains. Within each of these, there are many more detailed outcome measurement um, topics and some instruments and things like that. So they get quite a bit more detailed. But we wanted to understand not only what could be measured, but what different stakeholders felt should be measured. Uh, so the next thing that we did was we ran uh, an international online Delphi survey uh, in order to identify which outcomes were important to stakeholders. So we invited parents, researchers, uh, policymakers, and healthcare providers, uh, and we showed them three different types of communication. So based on that original taxonomy, we showed them, uh, we, you know, we asked them about communication that intended to inform or educate people. Uh, communication that intended to remind or recall people, and communication that intended to engage the community in vaccination issues. And we asked them to consider all of those outcome areas and to rate how important they felt they were for each of these things. Uh, and so this is just the top four outcome categories for each of these interventions. Uh, and what you can see is that when you present these types of communication to people and ask them about these outcomes, people very clearly uh, understand and recognize the differences between these kinds of communication. That's not really reflected in the primary studies. So in, in primary um, research studies, we see a, a huge range of communication being implemented, but often the same minor uh, or same very small set of outcomes being measured. Oftentimes, even in informational uh, or educational campaigns, knowledge isn't even measured. Um, and so it's I think an important thing, we can, we can show that people understand the differences, so we just need to sort of bring that now into practice and into evaluation so that the actual studies can um, contribute to a better understanding of the mechanisms of effect for this kind of communication. So this project, the results of this project are really um, sort of most obvious for researchers. So if you're doing research, um, I think that uh, the way of thinking and talking about communication that we established with the um, purpose-framed taxonomy is very helpful, but also um, obviously some of the information about what outcomes might be useful to measure would be very relevant for researchers. But it's actually also relevant for people in industry and practitioners and anyone who's implementing these um, communication campaigns. And as we've seen today, they come from 
you know, it's not just researchers developing them and implementing them on the side. Everyone's doing communication of some kind. Uh, and I think the lessons from our project are, um, first, to think outside of uh, one type of communication. Communication can have a huge range of purposes and it can have a range of formats and content. Um, and also to look and learn uh, from other contexts and other settings. You can, I think sometimes the idea is that research is done in a high income country and then we have to adapt that and try and implement it in a low income country. But what we found was some of the most innovative strategies were being developed in low income country settings, particularly for mass campaigns where um, you know, the need for uh, high uptake is really um, sort of drives innovation but maybe there aren't as many trials done there. But I don't, don't think that means that the high income country settings should uh, ignore what's being done in those contexts. Also, it's important to consider your stakeholders. Too often, I think the outcomes that we measure or the interventions that we design, um, as Angus was saying, we say what we want to say or we say what we think people want to hear. But it's very important to uh, understand who you're talking to, who you're reaching out to and what they want to know and how they want to be told about it and it, also with the outcomes, what they think is important um, to come away from that encounter with. And finally, just the importance of evaluation. I mean, so many, uh, maybe trials might evaluate, but so many policy um, programs and things don't have the funding or they don't have the um, know-how or the, or the resources to do an evaluation. Um, we need to push for more evaluation because it's a waste of the innovation and the time and the resources that were used to develop and design those interventions if we can't all be learning from them. Um, even if the evaluations can't be uh, very, very rigorous, even just looking uh, a bit more at some of the process outcomes would be very helpful and also reporting very clearly what was done. I think there's a, a really big um, gap even in the trial literature about the actual content of interventions. Um, and so as we've said, learning from different contexts, it's really important to know what everyone was doing so that we can uh, develop that evidence base and start to move these interventions forward. And thank you very much. And these are the members of the COMVAC team.